Um, what we're hearing from a lot of our clients is that taking a considered, practical and collaborative stance is the best thing that they have done. Um, and that's the advice that has had most impact for um, many of the businesses that we are working with. Um, some disruptions inevitable, but taking a considered, measurable and collaborative approach has enabled our clients to get to a place where they want to be and where they can take their business forward in these difficult times. So what should you be thinking about? Firstly, understand your contracts and plan ahead. Do you actually have a written contract in place with that key um, customer or supplier? It's surprising how often in practice you don't actually have anything in writing. If you do have something in writing, what are your rights and obligations under that, that contract? Understand what it, what it contains and um, the information that you have. Also, what contingency plans and alternatives do you have in place? Um, before you make that first telephone call, before warned and forearmed, Secondly, keep in touch with your suppliers and customers and anyone else that you might be working with who is pivotal for your business and keep on talking to them as things develop. At this time, communication matters more than ever and your relationships are going to be critically important. Collaboration is the key thing right now. You might be surprised at the solutions that you can come up with when you've spoken to someone else about an issue you're both facing and also um, how taking the right approach with people now might open up doors um, in the future for you. People will remember who has been helpful and collaborative and who hasn't um, in the next six months. Thirdly, consider alternatives. Are you reliant on one particular supplier? Can you source goods and services elsewhere if in particular you're obliged to um, supply them onto someone else? Are you tied into any minimum purchase obligations in your contract or any exclusivity obligations? If you are, is there anything about the current circumstances that might provide you with a route out to them? Quite often um, in circumstances where you're under an exclusivity obligation, if your supplier can't supply to you, um, then you've got that entitlement to go out to, to market and look elsewhere. Um, should you be diversifying your supply chain? Um, even now, many people will have done that already, but there, there are probably still steps that you can be taking. Um, as well, have you stockpiled for Brexit? And if you have, might those stockpiles now have an alternative use or might there be a different market for them? It's amazing what some businesses, particularly in the manufacturing sector, have been able to do with them goods that were stockpiled for one particular purpose and they've managed to change production facilities and production lines to produce something that's in very high demand um, now in the current crisis. Um, fourthly, consider the impact of any proposed changes on your key relationships. Do you need to continue to work with these people in the post-coronavirus world? If so, it's critically important to preserve the relationships now and the way you communicate with people and the way you work together will make a big difference to your future successes or otherwise. On the flip side, do the current circumstances actually provide you with a potential justification to exit a relationship that wasn't satisfactory anyway? Um, if you are looking at going down that route, then do take care and make sure that you bring any contractual relationships to an end legally and practically that when you're doing so, you don't cause any harm to your business. So make sure you've got those alternative supply lines in place um, and you've got arrangements before you um, to hand over before you press the button. Fifthly, if you do agree any changes or variations to your working practices, then make sure you document them so that you can rely on these in the future. Keep records of all the discussions you've had and the agreements that you've reached so you've got that contemporaneous record there if you ever need to go back to it. Um, if there are variation provisions in your foot contract, then make sure you follow those. Um, and if you are negotiating a settlement of an issue that's arisen or you're looking to ver negotiate a variation of pre-existing contract terms, um, then make sure you, um, your conversations are, are and are understood to be on or without prejudice and or a subject to contract basis until you've actually got an agreement that you want to record with your counterparty. I'd also advise that you monitor forms under the contract. Then if you've got any issues, you can adopt your contingency plans quickly. Um, other things that people are doing in practice, checking their insurance policies. Do you have business interruption cover, which is the most common type of cover that will um, respond to the current circumstances? If not, what other policies do you have in place? And look at extensions as well. Quite often where we are seeing cover, it's provided under an extension to the um, main part of the policy. Um, have, you, have you explored what your policy wording says? Um, if you think you might have a claim, then notify your insurer promptly. That's very important. And make sure you follow any notification provisions in your contract to the letter. Um, you need to make sure that you get your notification absolutely right. And if your insurer pushes back, um, as many are doing, and that's you, you probably see from the news, there are plenty of disputes with um, various big insurers at the moment. 
um, then don't necessarily rely on what your broker tells you. We've seen examples in practice of being, people being told they don't have cover when we've looked at the policy and perhaps they do. And conversely, um, brokers being quick to, to say that they think, think there might be something in there when there isn't. Um, if, you're, if you think, having looked at your policy, that you might have a claim um, and you might be covered, um, then we're happy to, um, to have a chat with you about that and we can look at the policy wording and um, see if it's worth putting in a notification to your insurer for you. Um, and the final thing, take care when you're entering into new contracts. We've all learnt lessons um, and things that we might do differently going forward um, out of what's happened in the last few months. Um, Rebecca will come on to how you might deploy some of the lessons that we've learned working with our clients from the current crisis in the new contracting world. So you've taken all the practical steps, um, but these are not working for you. You need to look at something different. What can you do next? Um, I'll hand you over to Rebecca, who's going to take you through force majeure provisions. Um, these were ones very much seen as boilerplate in a contract. They were rarely negotiated. In fact, people rarely thought about them, um, but they're now becoming a key importance and a real talking, talking point. Um, and now we'll turn to um, a second avenue where you might be able to get some relief, which is frustration. Thank you very much for that, Lindsay. So, Lindsay and I, when we were trying to work out what was the best thing to do for this for this webinar and how it's best to present it to you, we thought it would actually be helpful to start on the practical tips rather than launching straight into force majeure and frustration because everybody will have had their inboxes inundated with information about force majeure and frustration. But it would be remiss of us if we didn't talk you through that. So we're just going to give you a very high level of view and whistle stop tour of force majeure and coronavirus. So first of all, what is force majeure? So force majeure protects parties who are unable to perform contractual obligations due to events outside their control. In essence, if you've got a force majeure provision under your contract, it presses the pause button. And it means that if you have obligations under your contract that you have to comply with, then you can call on your force majeure clause to press that pause button and then to relieve you from those contractual obligations. But it depends entirely upon the contract wording, the extent to which you can rely on your force majeure clause. Now, force majeure is an express and not implied remedy. That means that you have to have the contract, with, sorry, the clause within your contract if you look to rely on it. And because it's an express right and it's in a contract which is usually negotiated between two parties, then you have to look at the wording closely to see the extent to which you can rely on it. So key questions then to be thinking through. As I say, is there a force majeure clause? As Lindsay said earlier, a lot of our clients don't actually get to the point of entering into contracts. If you haven't got a contract in place, then you won't be able to rely on force majeure. If you have a contract in place, look closely at the clause. And then is coronavirus or the consequences of coronavirus themselves a force majeure event? So you'd need to look for specific wording relating to epidemic, pandemic, and see whether or not you're covered. It might be that you have wording which relates to something being outside the reasonable control of a party. If that is in there, then you should be covered by coronavirus. But I will talk later when we come on to future proofing and planning ahead about that specific wording. And has force majeure caused a breach of the contract? Is it the only thing which has caused that breach or its consequences? Is there anything else which might have caused the breach? If there's something else that has actually caused the breach, then you can't use force majeure, you can't use that remedy as a scope gate for wanting to terminate the contract. And for instance, proof that performance has become more difficult or unprofitable or is, is insufficient won't be enough. And a failure of the supplier's intended source of goods will not generally amount to prevention for the, for the purposes of the force majeure clause. So then we need to think about what happens next. Do you need to give notice? As I said, it's an express clause, so you need to look at the specific wording of your force majeure clause, and it will say whether or not you need to give notice in order to rely on it. So if you do need to give notice, then you need to comply with the strict provisions of that clause, otherwise you won't be able to call on the remedy. And also the clause might require you to mitigate. It might require you to take certain steps or pursue certain acts in order to be able to rely on it. If you do, then you need to comply strictly with the provisions of the clause. 
And then what are the consequences of the clause? Again, this will be detailed within the clause itself. And in essence, it will be suspension. As I said earlier, it'll be that pressing of the pause button. So you serve your notice, it suspends your obligations, what acts of mitigations you need to take. And then generally, in most force majeure clauses, where the force majeure event has been ongoing for a period of time, it might be one, two, three, four plus months, the non-affected parties, the, the party who was not affected from complying with its obligations, will have the opportunity to terminate that, con that contract with the other party. And but think carefully as to whether that's something that you want to do. If you need this relationship going forward, then you might want to think really hard before you do that. So I'm just going to hand back to Lindsay now, who will talk you through frustration and coronavirus. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Rebecca. So what is frustration? Um, now, frustration is something that applies outside the strict terms of your contract. It's not like for, um, force majeure, where you're looking for an express contractual provision. Frustration applies under the general common law. Um, what the intention of frustration is, is to protect the parties where they are unable to perform their contractual obligations due to something that's happened that is entirely unforeseeable, so it couldn't have been predicted, and it's also the fault of neither of the parties to the contract. That event has to be something which makes performance of the obligations of one of the parties or of both of them either impossible, illegal, or something that's radically different from the obligations the obligations of the parties as they were contemplated at the time they entered into that contract or began that relationship. Um, now frustration is a very high bar to meet and it's rare that these arguments succeed in practice. In fact it's rare that people even seek to rely on them or um, litigate them before the courts. Um, the English courts like to uphold um, party, a party's contractual bargain. They like, if they've signed a written agreement, they like to hold them to the words um, of that written agreement and what they've entered into. And it's very, very rare that the English courts will allow the parties to get out of um, a bargain that they've entered into. Um, so if something becomes more expensive, so you can't get your widget or your, your component um, from supplier X, you have to get to supplier Z instead, that costs you twice as much, that therefore makes your own wood contract um, with your own customer unprofitable or a bad bargain well that won't be enough for frustration mere economic hardship even if something becomes unprofitable and economic um future perform that won't be enough um what we're looking for here is something that's truly exceptional and the current circumstances might in fact actually give you that so things like changes in the law such as the emergency legislation that came in um, if they make it impossible for you to perform a contract because you can no longer access your business premises because you you are prevented from doing so or you are no longer able to do something because at the moment it's illegal then potentially that might be something that is actually high enough to um, trigger frustration applying in your particular case but before you rush off and start, start to plead frustration, think long and hard about what you actually want to achieve in a situation. Because what frustration does, um, unlike force majeure, which is normally, depending on what your contract says, um, suspensory in nature, frustration brings the contract to an end. It kills it absolutely dead there and then. Um, now that might be what you want to achieve, but in many circumstances it won't be, particularly if it's a long-term relationship, it's a long-term contractual obligation and you don't just want to rip up the, um, the contract there and then and start afresh. Um, so do think carefully if you're um, in, a, in a place where you're looking that you might want to um, rely on frustration um, in relation to a relationship. Um, so we thought it'd be helpful to share with you um, some of our, what we've learned in our experience of working with clients over the past, um, well, essentially the, um, the beginning part of this year. Rebecca's going to look now with you at how you might protect your business pending next, the next pandemic and who, or potentially the next unanticipated big world event because a lot of the, the, the points that are being raised with us um, are very similar to things that um, people tried to raise or looked into, for instance, after the Brexit vote. Um, so um, how do you protect yourself for the future for, uh, for something that you, we might not predict um, that's around the corner? Thank you very much for that, Lindsay. And also just to reiterate on, on those tips that you started off with at the beginning, which was so helpful, and we're kind of going to follow through with that trend in this next part of the webinar. So as Lindsay said, it, it's critically important to think carefully about practicalities and to future-proof your contracts now. 
we have to consider what is the long lasting impact of this crisis in the new world. A new contracts will face particular challenges and are currently facing particular challenges as they are being concluded against the backdrop of current events, which continue to evolve and forecasts of secondary outbreaks and a reoccurrence of the virus in the winter. And as Lindsay said, if we talk about the force majeure clause as being a boilerplate provision, what wasn't historically a very much negotiated part of your contract has now, become, has now come under close scrutiny. And across a range of sectors, businesses are thinking about the longer term picture and how to protect their businesses in a world that will be significantly disrupted for a long time to come. So on, over the last few weeks and months, I've been negotiating a number of contracts and the force majeure clause has come under close scrutiny in relation to pretty much all of them. And my advice varies depending on whether I'm supplying, are the clients supplying or receiving goods or services. And when we're talking about the supply of goods, we're extensively negotiating the force majeure clause to make it as wide as possible to take into account possible delays or react to the supplier. They might have delays in their supply chain, they might have delays in collecting component parts or delays in relation to delivery. And then when we conversely, when we act for the recipient of goods, then of course we're going to be pushing back on those and we are pushing back on those provisions because they don't want a wide provision which will prevent their goods or services being received because that will impact upon their supply chain. And I've been acting for a client in relation to the supply of COVID-19 tests and under that specific contract we have been working really hard to make the contract as wide as possible. And then when we consider services specifically, we have to consider under your specific contract, will either party actually be delayed in providing or receiving those services as a result of the pandemic? A recent contract that Lindsay and I have been working on together related to a client who they had a, a contract in place for a period of five years, and it is in the contract, the client's contract with its customers was impacted, but the client's contract with their third party wasn't because the contract related to the supply of IT services. Their customers said to them that they could no longer receive the IT services, but I'm sure as everybody can appreciate right now, IT is one of the things which is keeping us all going. Um, we are all well able to receive our IT services. We're joining into webinars like this all the time. And actually the provision of IT services isn't an issue at the moment. The problem there was that they didn't want to receive the services because they didn't have any customers to supply them to. And as we said before, you know, that wasn't the cause and you can't use force majeure as a scapegoat. So you need to really consider where you are in the supply chain and what changes do you need and what changes do you want to push back on. As I said before, you know, what was once a boilerplate provision and a clause which didn't historically receive much attention has now become one of the most high profile and heavily examined of any contract. I'm sure Lindsay, you'll agree with that because we've had many conversations about this going forward um, historically and we'll have many more to come. And given that we can expect varying levels of coronavirus related disruption over the current coming months and likely longer, then you really do need to take time to consider this, this clause really carefully. So what can we um, share with you that we have learned? So key principles that we would suggest that you consider. The definition of force majeure. So does your clause specifically refer to epidemics and pandemics? It might have words in which relates to coronavirus and COVID-19. That won't be enough because it is likely there will be future epidemics and pandemics. It's likely there will be future viruses. You, you should refer also to the coronavirus outbreak, but not just in isolation. And a key thing that we would suggest that you put in all of your contracts and that you talk to us about assisting you with is adding actions taken by the government in connection with the coronavirus and future epidemics and pandemics. Because I, I think that I'm not alone in saying I didn't see the government reaction. Hindsight's a great thing. You can look back and say, oh, it was clear that this would happen. But at the time when whole countries were being shut down, I don't think anybody could have imagined that that would happen and the impact it would have on their businesses and on their supply chains. So if you haven't got a, a wording which relates to epidemics, pandemics, government sanctions, 
and future epidemics now and pandemics, and that does really need to be included. And then what events are covered? So force majeure clauses commonly refer to performance being prevented. And when we talk about prevention, that quite often means prevention in whole. However, in the wake of coronavirus, we're seeing many businesses being prevented from performing in full. However, they can still perform in part and provide some elements of their businesses or their services or providing reduced volumes of goods. And that's particularly when they themselves rely on disrupted supply chain. So then consider whether it would benefit you to broaden this wording to say that the clause applies if performance is hindered, if it's prevented in part, or if it's made more onerous. Also, I'd suggest that you consider wording that you might have in your contract, which relates to beyond a party's reasonable control. Because contracts which have been concluded prior to March 2020 and have that wording in them will likely still be protected. But contracts which are being concluded post March 2020 are going to have difficulty because secondary outbreaks are likely not to be covered as being something which was beyond an event which was beyond party's reasonable control or wasn't reasonably foreseeable. So we need to really consider that wording and see how that interacts and make sure we get the wording right. Then what are the consequences? As I said earlier, typical consequences of force majeure are the suspension of your obligations and the ability for a party to terminate. However, particularly where your supply chain is disrupted, you might want to think about options such as the ability to cancel individual orders or postpone fulfillment. And that might be, you might have a framework agreement and you might have a purchase order basis which works under that and you raise orders under your framework agreement. If that's the case, you likely won't want to terminate your contract in whole because you probably need that supplier going forward, but you might want to terminate parts of the purchase orders or the purchase orders and seek supply elsewhere if you're able to. So you want to really get more flexibility under your contract if your supply is hindered but not completely prevented. And also I would suggest that you require mitigation of the effects of a future pandemic or epidemic in these clauses. Another matter which I just wanted to raise, and you probably will be relieved it's not again about the force majeure clause, is in relation to payment provision. Now this is something which I am talking to clients increasingly about because payment provisions uh, really need to be considered as increased risk of businesses becoming insolvent in the wake of the coronavirus means that protecting your financial position is more important than ever. And carrying out adequate due diligence on the parties that you're contracting with, ensuring that they're stable, checking their track record and confirming their established businesses, finding out who they've worked with previously and looking into their assets to see if they've got an adequate pool of assets that they may have to rely on or fall back on can help you with mitigating your risk. Another key thing I'd like to say in relation to payment terms is the, the actual terms themselves, the, the time period that you have under which party can pay you and the payment terms and how they protect you. So most contracts will have payment terms of between 30 to 60 days, and those are commonly acceptable. And a lot of my clients don't even look at them and they will say to me, that's fine. Those are our standard payment terms. We're happy to accept that. But what I would like you to do is really think again about that. Think carefully because is, you know, from a supplier's perspective, in the current climate, if you're providing your goods and then you're being paid within 30 days after that, that's quite a long time period. A lot can happen in that duration. It might be that you need money in the bank to be able to be purchasing the raw goods because you're having a peak of demand. It might be that your customer has gone out of business by the time after you, between the point of delivery and payment. So think about the shorter payment terms and it might be, as I'm advising some of my clients, that payment in advance or provision of guarantees or security is necessary. As I said earlier, I've been working with a client who has been supplying force majeure tests. They've been supplying them to independent laboratories. And we have been working hard to negotiate the payment terms under that contract. 
and they're in a very strong position. So you also need to think about your bargaining position. What are you delivering? What are the goods and services that you're delivering? But in those instances, we have asked for payment up front and that has been accepted. But then conversely, we also do need to think about the customer's perspective. So if the customer is entering into a contract with you and you're asking for payment up front, that might put them off. It might um, it require them to look for another source of supply elsewhere who's not asking for payment up front. Because making payment in advance does create the risk if that's if the supplier is in danger of becoming insolvent, so the customer pays up front, but the supplier may not be able to supply those goods. So think carefully about those payment provisions and other provisions within your contract. There will be others that we haven't touched on today because we don't have enough time to do so. But please do talk to us if you have any queries on any specific clauses within your contracts. And then at this point, I'm just going to hand over to Lindsay because we have received in advance of this webinar and also through talking to our clients a number of questions and there are reoccurring themes that are coming up in the questions that we're being sent. I think a key one that you're going to start off with, I believe, Lindsay, is material adverse change clauses. Yes, thank, thank you, Rebecca. Um, yes, we've had quite a few queries from people about um, they may have looked at force majeure, they may not have force majeure provisions in their contract or they may not cover the situation that we're in at present. Um, so they're looking for alternative clauses that might help them um, and might cover the um, scenario that we find ourselves in. And one of the first places that people are turning to look is something called a material adverse change provision. Now, MAC clauses, as they're abbreviated to, are usually bespoke um, and they're often quite sector specific. Um, so you will need, as with force majeure, to look to the terms of your actual, your own contract and your own particular clause um, to see whether it might apply. Um, what MAC actually means will depend on how it's defined in your own contract. Um, unless it specifically refers in that clause to something like a pandemic or equivalent wording, then the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic right now um, is not likely to be considered to be a material adverse change event in itself. Um, however, what's more likely um, is that it's um, the impact of the current situation, the wider economic impact of the pandemic, um, or the, the widest, when our wider scenario, um, might have an impact on the one party's financial position um, and that itself might result in a, a MAC or the impact of government actions for instance a party not being able to lawfully carry on its business or access its premises again technically that might lead on to something that could constitute a MAC so do look wider than just for those specific words kind of pandemic epidemic etc in the clause however um, as the name suggests you rely, rely on material adverse change the event must be material and that means it's got to be substantial and significant um, and it has to also be for a significant period of time. If it's only a temporary blip, um, it's not going to be enough to get you over the, the hurdles that you need for, for a MAC. Um, and a party might face a challenge demonstrating that with the coronavirus outbreak, um, whilst it's having a big impact now, um, is that change going to be long term as opposed to temporary and something that you can recover from? Um, and whilst we don't know at the moment how long things are going to continue in the way they are um, we can't well I, I think very few people can see this is actually going to last forever um, but again the wording of your clause is critical here um, so if you're looking for instance in a facilities agreement which is one of the most common places where these clauses sit um, then a change is only likely to be seen as material if it actually affects the borrower's ability to repay the money that's being uh, advanced to it under that um, facility um, just be aware though, it's quite a heavy burden to prove that a material adverse change event has occurred. Um, as a general rule, how these things are used in practice um, is that they're seen as a backstop. So they allow a lender normally or a buyer um, of a business to come back to the, bring the parties back to the table and look to negotiate when something um, has happened. And usually that's an economic downturn. These things are very, very rarely litigated. I'm often asked to advise on clauses. I don't think I've ever asked to um, been asked to actually take one to court um, and certainly there is no case law at all, no reported case law on um, the use of MAC clauses during previous pandemics such as things like SARS and avian flu. Um, other thing to be aware of if you are looking to rely on one of these clauses, um, if you go down that route and it's later proven that you've got it wrong and what happened wasn't a material adverse change, then you're potentially opening yourself up for, for 
being in breach of contract and a damages claim from your counterparty if they've suffered a loss of, as a result. So if you're a lender, you rely on MAC, you don't advance the next tranche of the loan, um, the borrower sues and the event isn't a MAC, um, you could be liable for the losses that have been occasioned to that company. Um, so given the risk of enforcing these clauses and the, the events that they're intended to cover, um, it's quite a high bar burden to get home on one um, and it's not something we're generally seeing used in the market but they are contract specific they can be sector specific um, and if they think you they, they might help you out um, then do come have a chat with us and we're happy to have a, a quick quick look through them with you and see if there's anything in, in that um, another question that um, comes across my desk quite often um, in relation to well in relation to any any general, generally kind of unforeseen um, world events. So again, it was something that we saw quite a lot after the Brexit vote. Um, is whether you can use what's happened, whether you can use the coronavirus outbreak or the subsequent government action as a as a tool to terminate your contract. Um, I've seen quite a few people use this as an excuse um, in inverted commas to try and get out of um, a contract that they have with one of my clients. Um, the commercial reasons, um, for instance, someone trying to apply force majeure in circumstances where the services under this agreement were provided digitally. So there's nothing physically to stop these services being delivered. Um, clients, they were being delivered effectively by home. Uh, the customer wanted to get out of as many arrangements as it, as it could and it and work in house and put costs. Um, in those circumstances, the force majeure clause apply. Um, and we could send a robust letter explaining that any attempt to terminate that contract would itself be a breach the other party up to um, a damages claim from our clients. Um, so what's on the, if the boot's on the other foot, you've got a relationship that just didn't work or isn't working for you. You think, um, can I take advantage of what's happening now and um, try and engineer my way out of that? Um, just proceed with caution if you're looking to do that check what your contract allows you to do, check whether your force majeure clause, if you're going down that route, actually covers what's happened, and that it also allows termination. It's not just suspensory in nature, so most medical majeure clauses will provide a period of where the obligations are suspended while the event continues. When the event ceases, the contract's back on. Some will provide a right to termination, but check that look very carefully. Um, it's very rare that anyone, and I don't, I don't think I've seen anything like this in practice, that someone will have specifically drafted that an epidemic or a pandemic is, an ex, is a right that gives right, um, rise to an express right to terminate a contract. But more likely, there might be something that's a, uh, an indirect consequence of what's happened with termination rights, um, or what's happened might have put your other party in breach. Um, if you look at check very carefully, check whether the other party has to that's quite common. So um, in those kind of circumstances, they normally have a period, sometimes 20, sometimes 30 days, you would have to write to them setting out why they're in breach and they would have a period to respond. And it was only if they don't put the things right that they're in breach of um, within that period that your right to terminate arises. So if you, you're going down that, you need to be very careful that you follow that particular process. Um, and also make sure whenever you're looking at termination, um, under whatever grounds that you comply with the notice provisions to the letter. Uh, make sure you, you follow what's set out in that notice clause that your notice is, is in writing and it goes to the correct person um, at the correct place. Um, as I said, with, with termination, I always urge caution. Um, if you do, uh, obviously it's a, it's a nuclear option, it brings a relationship to an end. But if you do get it wrong and you try and terminate where you, you don't have grounds, uh, yourself could be you could be putting yourself into breach of contract and then that opens up uh, a potential damages claim from the, um, the other party that you're trying to exit with. Often where that will end up is a negotiation around the table, um, but you do need to be um, careful that you're not opening yourself up and weakening your position there. Um, and also with termination, particularly with things like IT contracts um, where you, or anything where, where there's, there's knowledge in place and you need a handover, think about how you're going to do this because you might need to um, have a, have a working transfer period where knowledge um, is shared and moved over to your new, your new supplier. Um, so always bear that in mind and the commercial aspects as well as the pure legal ones. Um, the other question um, that, 
that we've been asked. And again, we tend to um, to get it where there are kind of catastrophic market events is whether you can compel um, a supplier to continue to supply to you. Um, so imagine your, your, your supplier may have 10, 20, 30, 1,000 customers. Um, they will be looking at their books and, and if they can, they've only can make now, um, they're going to be picking and choosing and, source and, and supplying those key relationships or the ones where they're um, most fearful of adverse consequences if they don't continue to maintain the supply chain. So how, how do you, can you push yourself to the front of the queue? Um, it's actually in practice, even where you've got a written contract in place for the supply of goods, it's quite rare for any party to be un, under an absolute obligation to supply another. Um, most commercial contracts take the form of what's known as a framework agreement. So what you have is one agreement that sets out all the general terms and conditions that apply and all, all of the boilerplate. Then your customer will place a purchase order. The purchase order will be accepted by the supplier. And it's only at that point in time that a binding obligation arises to supply those particular goods. Um, if that's the case, then you, you, you are going to, you're going to really struggle with any kind of any credible argument that you can compare, unless a purchase order has been accepted, that you can compel a party to supply future purchase orders that haven't yet been placed and agreed. Um, even if your supplier is under an absolute obligation to supply you with certain goods and service or services um, and they're not doing so or they're reluctant to do so, um, compulsion is quite difficult in practice. Theoretically, what you can do is you can apply to the court for something called an order for specific performance. What an order for specific performance does is that um, compels a party to comply with its contractual obligations and actually do something. But in practice, the courts really don't like making any form of order that forces someone who doesn't want to do something um, to do something or forces two parties to carry on in business together where that relationship isn't going particularly well. Um, if you can demonstrate that what you're being supplied under this contract is, some, is in some way unique so you can only get it from this particular supplier or maybe one other um, then you might I say might um, be able to get some relief there. But if what you can get, you can get elsewhere in the market, it might be expensive, it might be twice as expensive to get it from somewhere else, or it might be less attractive to get it from there, or there might be delays, then what the court's going to do in those circumstances is say, well, you should have supplied it from suppliers that paid double the money and then brought a claim in damages for your loss. So wherever something is just more expensive, rather than a case if you cannot get it elsewhere, then the court is going to say that damages, getting money back, um, is, a, is adequate and it's not going to force that person to um, continue to supply you, you. Your remedies will be limited there. Okay, thank you very much for that, Lindsay. So, I think if we then move on to questions. So, I think there's been some questions which have been submitted whilst we've been talking, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. The first one that I've received um, relates to timing and when you should be uh, pursuing force majeure provisions under your contract. The question says, is timing important when considering force majeure or frustration? What about the strategic aspects and when do I need to do it? So I think probably, Lindsay, this is one for both of us. So I might start on this one. So when we're talking about strategy and is it strategically important when you should be considering looking at the contracts and invoking provisions of the contracts. I think that Lindsay and I might have a different response to this question, but we are both agreed that the best thing that you can be doing right now is talking to your suppliers and talking to your customers and that's why we purposefully started this webinar today with those tips of communication and collaboration and I think that it's important to understand what is within your contracts so that you know the extent to which you can rely on them. But actually, force majeure isn't really going to help you that much if it means that your obligations are suspended and then you are able to terminate. Because if you need that business going forward, you need that supplier or that customer as a key supplier of yours and intrinsic to the lifeblood of your business, then the last thing you want to be doing is to terminate that relationship. If you're going to need them in the new world, the most important thing for you to be doing right now is talking to them. Can they provide you with part of the goods, part of the order? As Lindsay said, we're hearing from a number of our clients that they did stockpile for Brexit and that they had a bit of a buffer. Talk to people. Are there some contracts that they have um, 
that have been terminated may have excess supply? Have you got excess requirements from your customers? Can you purchase more goods? And only by talking and having those conversations are you going to know what your next steps can be and can you plan ahead? But I do appreciate that it's all well and good to talk about collaboration and working together and building a stronger future. But realistically, I don't think people are going to be having such helpful conversations when the money's run out. So probably hand over to you, Lindsay, there and sort of where do you see disputes rising in the future and what do you think people should be doing now strategically to prepare themselves? Thank you, Rebecca. I think certainly um, I'm seeing quite, quite two quite extremes, really. We see um, a lot of people are working together um, and being um, very collaborative at the moment and that kind of forging new relationships, forging better relationships. But also there is one end of the market where people are being incredibly aggressive. Um, a lot of that is about getting paid. Um, it's We have seen examples of people um, kind of being very, very aggressive on... Um, essentially debt recovery in their supply chain, uh, pressing the nuclear button, threatening winding up conditions because they think their customer is about to go into um, an insolvency procedure. It gets them paid. Whether they will have a relationship at the end of this crisis um, is another matter. So we are kind of see people seeing um, taking very aggressive steps. If you're in something like a force, where you think it's a potential force majeure situation um, and you are contemplating approaching your customer your other party to enter into a dialogue to see how you might be able to mitigate that and work together but you do think that you can rely on that, that force majeure provision and you want to protect yourself um, then make make sure the the basis that you're going into and into any discussions um, entering into any um, written correspondence is reserving your position um, Quite often you do need to, on a force majeure provision, you do need to notify, you need to notify quite promptly. So you might want to make a notification that you think force majeure applies um, and then have a without prejudice conversation um, on the side um, about practical implications, what you can actually, what you might be able to do. Um, but just, just consider how the two routes um, fit together and make sure you're not doing or saying anything um, that could be, if you think you're going to have to fall back on your strict contractual provision, that could amount to a waiver of that, that could amount to admission and admission. So um, be very kind of clear to protect your position um, while you're talking to people um, informally on a without prejudice basis and, and trying to reach a resolution. Great, thank you. And, and then Rebecca, I'm just uh, cautious about time. Do we have time for another question? No, she's not there, so I imagine. Yeah, yeah. we've uh, we had one in the Q&A box. Okay. Can you read it out? Yeah, so um, it's from an anonymous attendee. If a contract force majeure clause is refers to pestilence, can it be inferred that COVID-19 is covered under that? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it would. What do you think, Lindsay? I think it would be very difficult to argue that pestilence... I, I understand the dictionary or the the certainly the biblical de definition whether it's the the dictionary definition is pestilence is a um, a fatal outbreak of disease um so that could potentially um cover coronavirus um i'm not sure whether there is any case law on the wording for things like the previous pan previous pandemics like uh, like sars um it it strikes me as being a slightly stronger wording word or slightly higher hurdle than something like an epidemic or a pandemic um, but potentially and something like that I think I'd want to look at the wider clause in context um, kind of or the wording in context with the um, the rest of that um, force majeure clause but I, I think it certainly it certainly will be arguable um, it's one of those things that I could probably argue both ways depending on what side of the fence I was sitting on. Not very usual way to see that I don't think I've come across any clause contracts like that. Not, yeah I don't think I've ever seen it in practice um that I have seen it used to describe in a non-legal sense the current situation uh, but I yeah I don't think it's something that we found in um in many, many contracts I've certainly not seen it in an insurance policy. No. Are there any more Rebecca or shall we wrap up? 
Um, there's been another one that come through the chat um, from Becky, who said her experience has been that suppliers want to draft a force majeure clause very widely, but that purchasers would want to draft a force majeure clause narrowly. Are there pros and cons with both extremes? For example, if it is drafted, drafted really widely, is that open to challenge as to its validity? Do you think it is likely that we'll end up finding a definition of force majeure that everyone will eventually begin to recognise as legally acceptable? Okay, that's a, a good question. Thank you for that, Becky. So, because the force majeure clause will come under the contract, and generally it will be a contract which is negotiated between two parties, and it, I'm imagining this will be on a B2B basis. So, you'll have two contracting entities who are working together and hopefully will have taken legal advice in relation to the contract that they're negotiating and both parties will be putting their best foot forward. So in terms of the validity, provided the parties have had time to consider and negotiate the contract, then I don't think that would necessarily be an issue. But as I said earlier in the presentation, where we're acting for suppliers, we are trying to make that as wide as possible. And where you're acting for the recipient of goods and services, then you don't want it to be that wide. And I think it will come down to negotiating power, bargaining position, and compromise, the parties have got to find a middle ground. And like any provision that we negotiate under a contract, you know, as long as the parties are talking and are aware of the risks and the concerns that they are both facing, and we are able to deal with that within the contract to find a middle ground which is mutually acceptable, then you know, it might not be that, I think that you're not going to have the vast extremes, there will have to be a middle ground. But the parties, and this is a reason why I said before, you, you'll need to talk to us, talk to your lawyers, because we can help you navigate that. We can talk you through the risks to your businesses to find a way forward for you to agree that clause. And then, you know, if you can't agree it, then I think I, you, know, you need to check with your insurers that you would be covered going forward. Do you have anything to add to that, Lindsay? Um, no, I think that's that's all sensible advice, Rebecca. Um, glad to hear it. Sorry, You're glad to hear that. I'm glad, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think that's probably it in terms of timing. So, just want to summarise and wrap up by saying that there will be winners and losers in the current climate. But above all, as Lindsay and I have both said, try as much as you can to preserve relationships as those are the things that are going to get us back to our thriving businesses or start the fire for new ones. Now, at Freeths, we first started writing about coronavirus. I co-wrote an article on the 29th of January, and we have been talking to our clients ever since. We have seen this escalating. We have seen, and we've been advising clients that it's taken an impact uh, the, this pandemic's taken an increasing impact and hold over our lives and our businesses. So we know what we're talking about and we're talking to people about this on a daily basis. To back up our advice and our support, we have set up extensive information on a coronavirus website, a coronavirus hub on our website, and there is a huge amount of content on there. All of the core elements are covered on there. So if you have any queries, then do please take a look at that. You'd be surprised with the amount of content we do have on that. It's also backed up by a free to use helpline. The helpline is manned by our lawyers and everybody's been fully trained, briefed, everybody knows what they're talking about so you're talking to experts and it may be that they can't assist you with your query on the helpline but you'll be referred on to one of uh, another lawyer that can have more time to talk you through your query. So please do use these resources and then just to sum up, Rui, thank you ever so much, everybody, for listening to us today. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy days. And thank you also for the questions that you've submitted. If we haven't had time to deal with all of them, we will follow up with you. And if you have asked a question, then either Lindsay or myself will be in touch to answer that for you. And then I've just put up our contact details on this slide here. Lindsay and I are available. So please do send us an email if there's anything that you want to talk through. If there's anything else that you think you'd like to go through in any further detail or any clarification, any parts of the webinar. And we wish you good luck for the future. These are very, very challenging times and we wish you all well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you everyone for joining us. And so if you do
you come off this webinar and you you think of something that you wish you'd ask, which is normally what happens to me when I attend seminars, um, then please do drop Rebecca and I a line and we'll, uh, we're happy to have a, have a look in the chat through with you. Thank you.